Hello, this is Lisa. How's everyone today? I hope everyone is having a beautiful day. I want to summarize a previous video um, of Genesis, the creation. Um, this is the second video, and I want to say a prayer to the Lord Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, before I begin. Heavenly Father, we want to thank you, Lord, that your anointing is on this word, Father, that you may reach others, Father and touch the hearts of those who don't know you and those who do know you, Lord, to just have one accord with you, Father, and may they repent from their ways, Father, and have oneness with you and develop a closer relationship to you, Lord Jesus Christ. We pray that your word just lives inside of us all in Jesus' mighty name. So I want to start with the completion of the creation that I read previously on the video. The creation, Adam and the, Adam and the Garden of Eden. Genesis 2, 1, 3, the seventh day of creation. And he rested on the seventh day. God did not rest on the seventh day because he was tired. He rested to show his creating work was done, to give a pattern to man regarding the structure of time and seven day weeks, and to give an example of the blessing of rest to man on the seventh day. God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it. God sanctified the seventh day because it was a gift to man for rest and replenishment. And most of us all, because the Sabbath is a shadow of the rest available through the person and work of Jesus Christ. First Colossians 2, 16-17 and Galatians 4, 9-11 make it clear that Christians are not under obligation to observe the Sabbath today because Jesus fulfilled the purpose and plan of Sabbath for us. And in Hebrews 4, 9-11 Yet Christians do not lose the Sabbath. Every day is a day of rest in the finished work of Jesus Christ. Every day is specially set apart to God. In it, he rested from all his work. Though God rested on the seventh day of the creation, he did not institute the Sabbath or show us his rest for his own sake. God does not take the Sabbath off, Jesus himself said. My father has been working until now and I have been working. John 5, 17, God does not need a day off, but man needs to see the rest of God and know he can't enter into it by the finished work of Jesus. This is the history of the heavens and the earth. This probably ends the genealogy of the heavens and the earth, a history given directly by God to either Moses or Adam, recording the history of God's seven-day creation. This was something no human was present to witness. And the day that the Lord God made the earth and the heavens, this is the first use of Lord, Yahweh, in the Bible. Our English word Lord comes from the Anglo-Saxon word for bread, as, do, as does our word loaf. Because ancient e Englishmen of high stature would keep a co continual open house where all could come and get bread to eat. They gained the honorable title of Lords, meaning disperses, dispensers of bread. Before any plant of the field was in the earth, the history begins before there was any vegetation on the earth at all. Back to Genesis 1-1, a time when there was only space and a watery globe we, knew, we know as the earth. The Lord God had not caused it to rain on the earth. When God first created vegetation on the third day of creation, Genesis 1-11-13, man was not yet been created to care for the vegetation of the earth, and there was no rain. The thick blanket of water vapor in the outer atmosphere created on the second day of creation. Genesis 1, 6 through 8, made for no rain cycle as we know it, but for a rich system of evaporation and condensation resulting in heavy dew or ground, ground fog. The Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground. When God created man, he made him out of the most Basic elements, the dust of the ground, there is nothing spectacular in what man is made of, only in the way those basic things are organized. And breathed into his nostrils 
the breath of life and man became a living being. With this divine breath, man became a living being like other forms of animal life. The term Che Nefesh is used in Genesis 121 and here yet only man is a living being made in the image of God. The word for breath is Hebrew is Ruach. The word imitates the very sound of breath is the same word for spirit as is the case in both ancient Greek, Numa and Latin Spiritus. God created man by putting his breath, his spirit within him. The Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden. Eden was a garden specifically planted by God. It was a place God made to be a perfect habitation for Adam and later Eve. There he put the man whom he had formed. The details in the creation of Adam and Eve teach us something after reading Genesis 1. We might assume man and woman were made at the same time, but the text doesn't specifically say so. We assume it. We don't, we don't know the details about man's creation. The tree of life, the tree of knowledge of good and evil. These two trees were among all the other trees God created and put in the Garden of Eden. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil was the temptation tree. Eating the fruit of this tree would give Adam an experiential knowledge of good and evil. Or it is possible that it is called the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Not no man would know good and evil, but so God could test good and evil in man. Now a river went out of Eden. The whole field of this Accounts gives the um, sense that it was written by an actual eyewitness of rivers and surroundings. Adam probably wrote him this himself. The name of the first is Pishon. These rivers are given specific names which answers the names of rivers known in either their modem or ancient world. However, the names of these rivers can be used to determine the place of the Garden of Eden because the flood dramatically changed the earth's landscape and erased these rivers. Put him in the Garden of Eden to tend and keep it. God put Adam into the most spectacular paradise the world has seen, but God put Adam there to work, do work, to tend and keep it. Work is something good for man and was part of Adam's perfect existence before the fall. Of the tree of, of knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat. The presence of this tree, the presence of a choice for Adam, was good because for Adam to be a creature of free will, there had to be a choice. Some opportunity to, to rebel against God. If there is never a command or never something forbidden, there can never be choice. God wants our love and obedience to him to be the love and obedience of choice. In the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. God not only made his command clear to Adam, but he also clear, clearly explained the consequences for dis disobedience. Genesis 2.18, God declares he will make a helper comparable to Adam. It is not good that man should be alone. For the first time, God saw something was not good. The aloneness of man. God never intended for man to be alone, either in the marital or social sense. I will make him a helper and comparable to him. God's blueprint for creating this companion to Adam was to make a helper comparable to Adam. A helper comparable in reference to the marriage relationship. God created woman to be a perfectly suitable helper to the man. This means God gave the plan and agenda to Adam and he and the woman together worked to fulfill it. Brought them to Adam to see what he could call them. If Adam had the capability to, to intelligently name all the animals, it shows he was a brilliant man. Since at this time Adam's intellect had not yet suffered from the fall, he was probably the most brilliant man who ever lived. Adam was the first and greatest of all biologists and botanists. So Adam gave names. Adam did not name any other animal after himself, calling any other animal man or human. By this we see he understood that he was essentially different from all the animals. They were not made in the image of God. But for Adam, there was not found a helper. It was obviously, obviously obvious to Adam that the animals came in pairs and he had no mate. Since God deliberately had Adam name the animals after seeing his need for a partner, Genesis 2.18, God used this to separate Adam to receive the gift of woman. 
God caused a deep sleep to fall on him. This is the first surgery recorded in history. God even used a proper anesthetic on Adam. The rib which the Lord God had taken from man, he made into a woman. He made into a woman. It is important to realize that there are not two beginnings to the human race, one in Adam and Eve. One in Adam and one in Eve. There was one beginning of the human race in Adam. And he brought her to the man. God brought Eve to Adam and created Eve out of Adam. He was first the source and the head. She was created to be a helper, perfectly suited to him. Thus, the subordinate relationship of wives to husbands is found before the curse, not only after it. This is now bone of my bones. Adam recognized that Eve was both like him, bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh, and not like him, woman taken out of man. Flesh of my flesh. Adam understood the essential oneness in his relationship with Eve. This point is so important that is it is referred to several times in the New Testament, including the great marriage passage in Ephesians 5, 28 through 29. So husbands are to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself, for no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it. Ephesians 5, 28 through 17. She was taken out of man. Adam recognized that through he and Eve were one. She was not the same as he. He understood that two different people were becoming one. 1 Peter 3 through 7 tells husbands to recognize that they are one with someone different, someone whom they must understand likewise your husbands. Dwell with them with understanding, giving honor to the wife as to the weaker vessel. She shall be called woman. Woman has been defined by many as compound, compounded for woe and man. As if called man's woe because she tempted him to eat the forbidden fruit. But this is no meaning of the origin word, nor could it be intended as a transgression was not then committed. They shall become one flesh. The marriage principle stated here is based upon the dynamic of oneness yet distinction. A man and a wife can truly come together in one flesh relationship, yet they must be joined in a spiritual fact. But the benefits of that oneness are not appropriated by accident or by chance. So this is a brief summary of Genesis, and I hope you have enjoyed this um lesson and summary and i pray that you apply god's word in your life daily and um i pray that you uh forever continue to keep god in your heart your mind your spirit your soul to reverence the lord god and to give god thanks and praise um this is lisa um subscribe to this channel give likes and i thank you always i love you the Lord God loves you and go in peace and stay safe and just thank God for all things. I'll um, come to you later with another um, great lesson. In Jesus' name, we pray always in Jesus' name. So thank God for all things and have a great day. Bye-bye. See you soon.